So here we are asked to determine the value of this angle here that will maximize the amount of water held by this rain gutter. So we can imagine this gutter shaped structure here filling up with water and our job is to maximize the amount of water. And what's a little challenging here is that when we think about maximizing the amount of water, we might think about volume. But it turns out we can think of the problem in a different light. We can actually think about how to find the maximum area of this sort of trapezoidal region. And if we maximize the area of that trapezoidal region, then we will in turn maximize the volume or the amount of water present within it. So let's think of that in terms of area rather than in terms of volume, and that will begin to help us understand this question. Now, in addition, we have included some extra labels in the diagram here. So we took the trapezoidal region and we added some extra labels. Notice that when you draw this sort of horizontal line across the top of the gutter, that this angle theta right here would be the same as this angle theta right here. Basically, these are alternate interior angles. And as long as these two lines here and here are parallel, then those two angles are also equal to one another. And so we have labeled that theta inside of our gutter accordingly. We've also labeled this dimension right here D, and then the height of the trapezoid is H. And we know from symmetry that this triangle on the left side of the gutter is going to be the same as the triangle on the right side of the gutter. And then in between the triangles, we have a sort of rectangular region. Now again, we're trying to think of this problem in terms of area. And what we need to do is come up with an expression for the area in terms of theta. That's the next challenge, is how do we express the area of this trapezoid in terms of an angle? Well, let's begin to express it in a different manner without theta first, and then we'll incorporate theta into it. So we'll see what we mean in a moment. We're just going to say that the area of this trapezoid as a function of theta will equal the following. Now let's investigate the two blue triangles. We know from geometry that the area of a triangle is one half times the base times the height. The base of the blue triangles is D and the height is H. So for that first blue triangle, you would have one half times the base, which again is D times the height, which is H. But as noted, the triangle on the right side of the diagram is congruent to the one on the left side. So we could basically take this area and multiply it by two to get the total area of those two triangles. We next look at the area of the central rectangle. Rectangle's area is just the base times the height or length times width if you prefer. So that would just be 10 times H. So this would be the area, but at this stage, you'll notice we don't have it yet expressed in terms of theta. So that's gonna become the challenge. Before we meet that challenge, let's just simplify a little bit. Of course, two times one half is just one. So this is just one dh and then plus 10 h. Great, now somehow we have to introduce theta into our area formula. And let's consider this triangle here one more time. And if we look at that triangle carefully, let's investigate the sine of that angle theta. Now the sine of that angle would equal the opposite side, which would be the H, divided by the hypotenuse, which would be 10. Now, if we multiply both sides of that little equation by 10, we can see that H is equivalent to 10 sine theta. So this h here and here in the formula, we can substitute 10 sine theta, and that's what we're gonna do in just a moment. But let's also look at the cosine of that angle. So we're still looking at the same triangle, but this time we're gonna look at the cosine of that angle. And we know that the cosine of the angle would equal the adjacent side, which would be d, divided by the hypotenuse, which again is 10. Multiply both sides of this equation by 10, and we can see that D is equivalent to 10 cosine of theta. So that D in the area equation will be substituted with 10 cosine theta. So let's go ahead and make some substitutions here. We now know that area as a function of theta is going to equal D, which is 10 cosine theta, times H, which is 10 sine theta, and then add that to 10 times h, and again, h is 10 sine theta. 
We'll simplify this just a little bit right here. You have 10 times 10, so we can make that a 100. And we'll just do that on the fly here. And then we also have another 10 times 10 there. That's going to make that 100 as well. So what we'll do is just reorganize it a little bit here. And this is much better, this equation, because now we have area as a function of our variable theta. And in fact, what we want to note is that the theta is bounded by two different values. If you think about the gutter, the smallest possible value for theta would be zero. You could imagine taking this end of the metallic sheet and bending it all the way down so that it sits right here, sits horizontally flush. And then same thing over here if you bent it all the way down like that. So that would make theta equal zero in that particular case. But on the other hand, you could also take that edge and bend it all the way up here so that it's oriented vertically like so. And then same thing with this edge of the gutter orient it vertically like that. So in that case, hopefully you can see that the theta would be 90 degrees. So there and there would be 90 degrees. And so the upper bound of the angle would be 90 degrees. So it's important to keep in mind that for our area function, theta is going to be bounded by those two values. And that will become important later on. Okay, so now it's turning into a standard question of just find the absolute maximum value of the angle. That's really what we're trying to do now. Absolute maximum. Or rather we should say we're finding the absolute maximum of the area as a function of the angle theta. So that's what we're trying to figure out and to find the maximum value of the area we would have to compute the derivative of our area equation. So that's what we're going to do next and we'll notice for the derivative of this term right here, we're going to need to employ the product rule. Now when I do my product rules, I like to call this first function f and this second function g. And then the product rule I like to imagine is fig plus gif. It's a little mnemonic device that helps me. And so here we go when we do the product rule. We start out with f prime, so that would be the derivative of 100 cosine theta. And of course that would be negative 100 sine of theta. Then multiply that by g, which is just sine of theta. And then add that to g prime, so the derivative of sine of theta, which is cosine of theta, multiplied by f, which is the 100 cosine theta. So that would be the product rule derivative of that first term. I'm going to slide this over because we still have to do the derivative of 100 sine of theta, but that's just going to be plus 100 cosine of theta. So there is our derivative, and we probably recall that once we compute the derivative, we have to set that derivative equal to zero. And this allows us to find what we call a critical number or a critical value for theta. And it looks a little dicey, and it is to some extent. Why don't we first factor out a 100? We have a 100 here, here, and there. And so let's go ahead and factor out that 100. This will leave us with negative. Now we can also multiply those signs. That becomes sine squared of theta. Plus, and then here we have cosine times cosine. So that's cosine squared of theta. And then we have plus cosine theta. Now the challenge of this equation is that it is in terms of both sine and cosine, which is a little bit problematic. Perhaps we recall an identity here that tells us sine squared of theta is equivalent to one minus cosine squared of theta. So this sine squared of theta right here, we're gonna substitute with this expression right here. Now, do this carefully because you still have this negative sign in front of that sine squared. So you're going to have 100 on the outside times negative, and then you're going to want to put the 1 minus cosine squared in parentheses, like so. And then you have the rest of it here. Okay, this is much better, isn't it? Because it's all now in terms of a single trigonometric function, cosine. We might next want to distribute this minus sign here. So this gives us negative one plus cosine squared of theta plus 
cosine squared of theta, and then plus cosine of theta. This 100 in the front is annoying me, so why don't we just divide both sides by 100? That will cross it off on the left side. And so now we just have sort of that. Notice the right-hand side still remains 0. We don't any longer need this bracket either. So we're getting somewhere. We can combine the cosine squareds to make 2 cosine squared of theta, and then plus cosine theta, and then minus 1 equals 0. Now, this is somewhat miraculous because it looks like this is going to factor, and it was probably designed to do so. So we're going to have 2 cosine of theta times cosine of theta. And let's see here. We're going to need maybe put a plus 1 here and a minus 1 there. Let's make sure that works, though. 2 cosine of theta times cosine of theta would give us 2 cosine squared of theta. So that checks out. 2 cos of theta times 1 is 2 cos of theta. And then here you have cos of theta times negative 1. So that's a negative 1 cos theta. Combining those gives us a positive 1 cosine of theta. That's exactly what we have here in the middle. So that all checks out. And then, of course, we would have to multiply the negative 1 by 1, which gives us negative 1 right there. So it does factor, which is nice. We can now set each factor equal to 0. 2 cosine of theta minus 1 equals 0. And then cosine of theta plus 1 equals 0. If we solve out the left side, we can see that cosine of theta is going to equal 1 half. You have to think about what angle has a cosine equal to positive 1 half. And hopefully remember that that is equal to 60 degrees. Over here, you have cosine of theta is equal to negative 1. And if you think of the cosine function, kind of graphed looks like that. Right at that angle here, the value is negative 1, and that is 180 degrees. So the solution here for that would be 180 degrees. However, let's not forget that theta was bounded between 0 and 90 degrees. So we can actually ignore that value there. We can reject it. So we have ourselves a critical value. Now, remember, we're trying to determine the absolute maximum area as a function of theta. And to do that, what we can do is the test in which we plug in the two endpoints of our interval, as well as the critical number within our interval. It's known as the closed interval method. So in other words, we're going to have to compute the area when 0 degrees is plugged in, the area when 60 degrees is plugged in, and then the area when 90 degrees is plugged in. And then whichever value is the largest will indeed be the maximum. So we need to go up and find our area function. And it is this monstrosity right here. So let's grab that and maybe paste it down here for reference. So at this stage, we could plug 0 degrees in first. Now, the sine of 0 is 0. So both of these terms would actually go out to 0 if you plugged in 0. So that just means that that would give us an area equal to 0. Not very promising. We could also plug 90 in. Now, we all know that the sine of 90 is 1, and the cosine of 90 is 0. So this would drop out. Over here, you'd have 100 times 1, so that would give us an area of 100. So that's looking perhaps promising. But now we want to plug in 60 degrees. And we'll be more careful here because there's some simplifying that needs to be done. So area as a function of 60 degrees would be 100 cosine of 60 sine of 60 plus 100 sine of 60. Now cosine of 60, again, is 1 half. So it's 100 times a half. And then the sine of 60 is root 3 over 2. Now, if we simplify the first term, you're going to have 25 root 3 plus and then 50 root 3. So you get 75 radical 3. So when the angle is 60 degrees, the area of that sort of trapezoidal gutter becomes 75 radical 3. On a calculator, 75 radical 3 tells me that that's about 130, which is definitely greater than 100. So that means 60 degrees will be the angle that yields the maximum area. Let's just make sure we have actually answered the question here. It says, how should theta be chosen? Well, we just stated it. Theta should be 60 degrees. That is the final answer. 
So in case you need to go out there and design a gutter, you now know how to do it. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you're interested in making a small donation to my cause, I would greatly appreciate it. If not, no worries. I appreciate you taking the time to watch the videos anyways.